Hi, Dr. Kenny. It's uh, Kendra Grubb, and I'm here with um, Suzanne Barron and a panel of Dr. Wayne Batchelor, Kim um, Skelding, and Elizabeth Willett. Thank you, and uh, thank you for showing us your case from New York. Please tell us who's with you. Yeah, good afternoon, and uh, thank you, CRT, for giving us this opportunity for all women's uh, structure live case. Myself, Dr. Annapurna Kinney, the director of the CAT Lab. I have uh, my fellow here. Introduce yourself. Negor, I'm a structural fellow at Mount Sinai. I did interventional at uh, Mount Sinai, and I'm proud to be with this group. Yeah, I have uh, anesthesia. Who is Moy? Yes, Dr. Moy Tren. I'm one of the cardiothoracic anesthesiologists. And echocardiographer uh, Vivian. Dr. Vivian Abascal, cardiology. So this is our team that we plan to do a structural case, and we can start uh, with the introduction of the patient. If we can start some. Uh, our slides. So this is a 82-year-old female who actually presented with worsening NYJ class 3 symptoms of uh, shortness of breath and uh, fatigue. She did have CAD in the sense of, uh, as a, a workup of tower. Uh, we found that she had one vessel CAD and underwent a PCI at that time. History of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, ortho, uh, sorry, arthritis, and then more important is uh, obesity. Uh, myeloproliferative disease, for which reason, for bullous pempigoid that she's on uh, steroids. And uh, you can see her uh, medications, uh, good medical therapy that she's on. Uh, creatinine is okay. Uh, platelet hemoglobin is fine. So we can show that transthoracic uh, echo, but which actually showed that uh, she had severe calcific um, aortic valve with a mean gradient of 47, valve area of uh, 0.79 centimeter squared. With mildly dilated uh, ascending aorta of 4.4, mild uh, moderate valvular regurgitation, EF was uh, normal. I'll be actually joined by uh, Gilbert Tang and uh, Sahil Kera. Gilbert Tang is a surgical director of uh, Mount Sinai. And then uh, we have Sahil Kera, who actually is also the structural interventional director here at Mount Sinai. Are you going to show the echo now? You can, okay. Yeah. So we can see we the echo, but we can't hear the echocardiographer. Yeah, yeah, right here. Can you hear now? I can hear. Can you hear yes. me? Yes. Okay. Parasternal long axis view, you can see the valve is calcified, aortic stenosis. The left ventricle looks good in this picture. Um, now we go to the four chamber view. Left ventricular function is good. I'll go back for a minute for the short axis is after this. A little bit of AR, mild to moderate probably. Dry leaflet aortic stenosis. You can see the AR. In the three chamber view, normal LV function, a peak velocity of four, gradient of 67 and 43. Pressure half time was 394 for moderate and no effusion. That's it, That's it for echo. Okay, good. We can go back to our slides. So that was uh, what we had the echo there. This is a CTA. So you can see that the CT certainly shows a small annulite, the mean diameter just above 20 millimeters with an area of 338 and perimeter 66. The LVOT is a little bit uh, larger, but pretty uh, reasonable in 22 millimeters. And mean diameter, you can see there's the calcium at the annulus on the long axis. Next slide. So you can see, as I mentioned before, there's a dilated ascending aorta. The STJ is a little bit large. Sinuses are very large. So it's a root is a little bit enlarged. Next slide. So there's a bit of motion artifact on this study, but you can see that the left main height, the right coronary height, and the sinus height are not an issue. Very generous root in terms of a coronary standpoint. So you think yes, this will be a small annuli, right? Yes. 
You can see the aortic root angle is almost 60 degrees, so it's approaching horizontal um, aorta. Next slide. And you can uh, talk access. So, Hale, you want to talk about access? Yeah, no, thanks, Gilbert. Uh, Dr. Kinney. Yeah, this is a relatively straightforward transfemoral case. Uh, right would be the main access site. Left has a little bit of posterior calcium. So, it shouldn't be an issue here. Next slide, please. Uh, sentinel embolic protection. Uh, we'll show you images, but uh, there was an occlusion of the uh, innominate, so unfortunately, cannot use it. That's it, right there? Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's it. So if you see here, I think taking everything into account, the, this case, our patient who has an annulus of 20.6 uh, with a perimeter uh, 66, I think will uh, fit well into FX uh, 26 millimeter valve. That, uh, that is the plan that we are going to be doing this valve today. Now we can uh, open up for discussion. Dr. Kinney, um, can you talk to us a little bit about how you chose the, the self-expanding versus balloon expandable valve and what went into your decision making for that? Want to speak yeah. Gilbert? So, uh, Nigar, you want to comment? I think uh, you've worked with us now for almost a year, so you can kind of discuss the pros and cons of balloon expandable versus self-expanding in terms of the sizing of this particular patient. Sure. Uh, for the, um, there are some benefits of the balloon expandable. Uh, there is less chance of the pacemaker, and uh, but if there is a calcium in the onulus and in the valve, that's uh, more chance for the rupture. So we go with the self-expandable. With the self-expandable uh, valves, we should be careful about the, the depth of the insertion for the future uh, basically pacemaker and also we'll take a consideration for baseline EKG to make sure if the patient has any baseline EKG uh, problems like uh, right bandle or first degree that will increase the chance of the pacemaker with, the, with this valve. I think the other thing that you consider, as you mentioned before, is the sizing, right? So the mean diameter is 20 millimeters, and you rightfully point out that that end of the calcium can risk rupture. So you would have to use a 20 millimeter balloon expandable valve versus a 26 millimeter self-expanding valve, which from a hemodynamic standpoint in an obese patient uh, is not trivial in terms of severe PPM or prosthesis patient mismatch. Thank you for that explanation. So while you get into position, I'm going to talk to the panel a little bit. You know, there's this thought that, well, this patient's you know, late 80s. Does it matter? I, I can throw a 20 and I'll be fine. Wayne? Yeah, I mean, it's an excellent question, uh, Kendra. I, I think we'll have the answer when the uh, SMART trial uh, results come out. And that's an extremely important randomized prospective clinical trial that will be comparing in small annuli a balloon expandable prosthesis with a self-expanding option. Um, uh, it'll be interesting because the endpoints are, are going to be death, stroke, and heart failure, but also bioprosthetic uh, valvular dysfunction. And there'll be some interesting patient prosthetic mismatch information. We don't quite know the answer to that question, but I think that trial is going to be pivotal in defining where, how big of an issue this is because we see this quite a bit, and it's going to be full of women, which is going to be extremely important for, uh, for some of these gender differences. Okay. I mean, I think we already have seen data, at least five-year data, and some of it was presented at this meeting, um, that there's dura you know, durability and the hemodynamics are really um, just superior with the, med with the uh, balloon, sorry, self-expanding valve. Um, so I, I think it's really important to think about that and be really patient-focused, um, because starting off with some patient prosthetic mismatch is only going to get worse. Elizabeth, you're part of the uh, heart team discussion and when you're thinking off? about valve uh, selection and talking to your patients about this. Is this something that comes up for you? Yeah, it's definitely something that comes up. Um, and one of the things that we really want to know as well is how active those patients are um, because it is going to make a difference with their hemodynamics. If they're still, you know, even though she's 80 years old, she might be extremely active and, and needs that uh, increased cardiac output. So those types of things that we're looking at every day and making sure we're doing a good assessment of that. Do you I think more and more we're seeing the age, even though the guidelines talk about age, we're seeing very, very active 80-year-olds. I think that this this concept of, oh, they're old, it doesn't matter what you do, I, it does matter. And they're still playing tennis, and they're running around after grandkids, and they want to have an active life. And so that first valve platform, even if you're 80, makes a difference. 
Super important. I'm in Washington State, and we have two um, ski instructors. One is 93 and one is 97. I think you're going to start seeing that more and more. Yes. So they're crossing the valve here, and, um, and hopefully we'll, we'll be across in a second. When you, um, when you counsel your patients about lifetime management, so let's not have this 80-year-old. Let's take this down to, you know, your 70-year-old. How are you deciding then, because you, you got all this data about uh, coronary reaccess and valve and valve, are the rules the same? Biggest, biggest EOA, best hemodynamics is best first? Yeah, I mean, Kendra, that's an excellent question. You know, I, I think it's, you have to have an individualized approach for the patient that's in front of you, and you have to think about longevity, um, how active they are, size of the annulus, what's going to be the difference between putting in a balloon expandable and a self-expanding prosthesis, and, and, and try to make the best decision. You know, it's interesting, the average life expectancy after you get a TAVR is around 11 years, so um, it, it just depends on the patient. But what we're seeing now is iatrogenesis. We're seeing a lot of patients come back who had valves put in when they were, you know, 20. We're now, we're now into, you know, 10 years since we've had these prostheses, and we're now start, starting to see the, de the uh, degeneration uh, folks come back, and we're having to make difficult decisions. So I think it's an, ex it's an extremely important point, and when we put that first valve in, we have to be thinking Six. about the next one, make the best decision for the patient, not only now, but also assuming they're going to survive for another 10 or 20 years. And I think coronary artery disease, um, it really plays into the equation. Both valves have issues with reaccess. Um, and so we have to think about that. And so depending on what the height the is of, um, of the coronaries, you know, does help make with the decision making as well. And I think also when we're starting to think about, you know, uh, valve durability and specifically when we start to think about HALT and HAM and things like that, you know, uh, certainly sinus uh, size and, you know, what the flow dynamics are um, in certain patients uh, around the valve leaflets also comes into play as well for me. So it's, it's becoming something that's become so much more complex than when we started where, you know, I think about you know, back in, you know, 2011 and stuff, and it was, you got two, two size valves and you got to just pick one. And now there's so much thing, many more things that we're taking into consideration. And so she brought up a good point. Um, you know, I'm a cardiac surgeon, so I'm not accessing coronaries. How big of a deal is this really? Uh, at two in the morning during a STEMI? <laughs> you know, I think, I think it's becoming less, it's becoming, I mean, this is a, it's becoming both more and less of an issue. Um, and I think in that setting, you know, one, because we're getting to understand it a little bit better and we're able to predict using both, you know, AI and advanced CT techniques about who we're going to have difficulty accessing. Um, but on the other hand, we are putting more and more valves into patients. They're younger and younger. People are developing coronary disease. We are just seeing this more frequently. Right. And, you know, I, you know, I've been doing, um, Taver since 2009 and you know we didn't even think about coronary access being an issue we just accessed the coronary <laughs> arteries um, and we learned tips and techniques how to do it best and I think you need to think about it you need to do it slightly differently um, but I, I think that we need to do a better job at training our fellows and young faculty on how to access the coronaries um, because there is a different technique, but it shouldn't limit us. Well, and we see here that uh, Dr. Keeney is now across the valve. Um, I believe that she's uh, going to put a pigtail in um, and get some hemodynamics. But um, team at Mount Sinai, why don't you catch us up on where you are with this procedure? Yeah, so initially we did try uh, AR2, which is a usual uh, catheter that we like to use, but I think I had to change it to AL1, and you saw as soon as we changed the catheter, we were able to cross within a few seconds. So now I'm going to go with the pigtail, but I think we may be stuck. So I have to... Give some volume. Yeah. Please. Yeah. So oftentimes in these cases, you see this where you're, you're caught a little under the mitral valve and there's some, yeah. some ways to uh, overcome this. Um, Dr. Boucher, why don't okay. you tell the audience, well, well they're working, we can, yeah. we can talk about how to fix this. Yeah, a lot of times you can just fashion the pigtail, advance it, and sometimes get that C-curve on it. A lot of times I'll go slightly REO and just try to get an, an impression. So, and it's good to go REO and LEO. In the LEO, you can really see how far uh, laterally you are 
and then reposition your pigtail and then advance the pigtail out okay. and then that's as you that's yeah. Yeah. extend the wire unsheath the um the wire by pulling the pigtail back as you advance the wire out and she's got it in a great position now it's a, it's a great spot because you know that you're not going to be uh, you're, it's unlikely that you're going to be under the mitral valve when you're in that position at the apex. And the trick you saw her do is actually come all the way back under the annulus, move her wire, and then just push her catheter. And that's what we teach our fellows. It's pretty benign. You're not going to push it out the ventricle because it's just a pigtail. Um, Can we show the hemodynamics times, by the side? Can we see so your hemodynamics? No, thank yeah. you very much. Yes, we have that there. So essentially, I think like you guys discussed the same, you have to pull the wire, the pigtail all the way back to the base just below the valve and then uh, re-advance the wire and then go with the pigtail. But it's very important you fix it uh, in the beginning if you're under the mitral valve. Yeah. So um, Gilbert, you want to discuss about, because we were the first one to publish about a coronary reaccess with both the kind of uh, valves, especially yeah. with Evolute. So as, can you t well, let's talk about that. Sure, as, as you know, Dr. Kinney and Dr. Sharma and, and our uh, group has uh, actually created an app, a mobile app that you can download for free on Android and Apple platform. And that was coming from the Jack 2018 State of the Art Review. Uh, we now also have a website to actually teach uh, cardiologists who don't do TAVR how to actually access coronary, some of the tips and tricks on catheters in terms of algorithm, what's a first line catheter, what's a second line, uh, etc. So we now, of course, uh, have routinely do commercial alignment with the Evolute platform. So, uh, you know, we now actually presented the FX, Evolute FX data that is uh, over 96% of the time we achieve uh, good or excellent commercial alignment with this valve now. So in terms of corner access, mechanistically will certainly be uh, easier than before where we just kind of put the valve in without taking that to account. And to the panel's the discussion about lifetime management and younger patients, I think it's going to be uh, more important. So Gilbert, have you changed any of your implant technique with switching over to FX? Good question. Yeah. Uh, so, so here you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, sure. We haven't changed our uh, basic techniques here, no. but yes, uh, FX is really a predictable yeah, valve. Down. You basically see what you get. A um, couple of things. During the nose cone retrieval, we are definitely slower than before. Um, and we always check in both RAO LAO views. As long as your two dots are below Stop. at a reasonable depth, we take it. So nothing else has changed except that we've become a little more cautious, a little more thoughtful during the nose cone retrieval, especially in patients who have small left ventricles and uh, have a small ascending aorta. And what about from the panel? Any, any new tips and tricks for using this valve? Did you change what you were doing? Now I haven't changed really my technique. I just think it's made it a lot easier to get across the arch and it's a little let, you know, it's a little more friendly. Um, I think the stability of it uh, for new operators is more helpful. Um, but for folks who are used to the old one, it just makes what you're doing already easier. Yeah, I, I really like the, uh, the iterations with the FX. Uh, that 360 degree flexion capability is much uh, more friendly. I think that it sits in the ascending aorta uh, in a more coaxial fashion, and you're less likely to ride on the greater curvature on the or in the lesser yeah. curvature. And advancement, the the the, the tip of the device is it, it it's really very facile. I think it's a nice uh, improvement. And cusp alignment is is almost guaranteed. It's very very high uh, with the FX versus the pre previous iterations. I agree with you. I think that the coaxialness has really made a difference as well, and you're much less likely to, to, to be having, uh, you know, the left coronary side, you know, diving in in a way that is, you know, un, unpredictable. So I've, I've really found that that's made things easier. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing we're doing differently is instead of starting at kind of mid pigtail and letting it descend and worrying about exactly where you are and a lot of push and pull, you're, you just kind of set it where you want it, um, kind of at the bottom of that non-coronary cusp and just deploy it. And it's just a lot more stable and, and it's an easier deployment with, in my experience, less recaptures. Um, but it looks like these guys are, are just putting the, the valve on the wire here. Um, any other comments on the new valve? Anybody uh, have any comments on the gold markers? Do you, do you find that helpful on the FX or not really? Just out of curiosity. I find it reassuring <laughs> when I think about commissural alignment. And I also think that it makes that three millimeter depth of implant so much easier. I mean, as you're trying to figure out if you were three, four or five on looking at the actual cell, 
um, that was much harder than having actual markers that you know were reliably at three millimeters. So Gilbert, okay. take us through where you are right now. So we track it across the arch. You can see that the hat marker is in the outer curve. It tracks very nicely, as you see, and you guys commented uh, very well. It just crossed the valve very easily. And so now we're going to put the pigtail on the non-cusp valve. We go to the cusp overlap view. Any thoughts about the and wire what choice here? What do you do your BAV with? Uh, 20, because the min diameter, minimum diameter is around 20, uh, and very calcified valve. So we prefer pre here to uh, avoid post dilatation. Uh, and also it avoid the valve from being uh, potentially constrained at the deployment. It's a very steep uh, caudal view, so I just want to make sure watch your watch your feet and, and instead watch your head. You can see the safari wire really nicely come down to the two, uh, to the two apex. questions we had. We can uh, discuss is how many people really like to pre dilate, and then uh, Sahil was asking one fifty. Wh what's the usual wire of choice? One fifty. Safari 50. here. Habib, one fifty, please. Too high. Too high. Okay. 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 Good, 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 good. You know, I think it depends okay. on the hemodynamic situation. Okay, 100. This, this patient's 100. pressures, they're pacing now, but it was um, 100. fairly low. So I might good. go at 120 or so, 120, 130. Well, we, this is a hyperdynamic ventricle, as you saw, Wayne. So we, we like to have just two numbers. We don't change numbers per case. And you can see that excellent here. Depth. Excellent depth is three and two. Yeah, okay. You agree? You agree? Yeah, excellent Happy. position there. Yeah, yeah. good. Okay, so and you, the wire back and you so saw earlier, yeah. sorry, you saw earlier that two or three dots were added up below the annulus, so we know that there's not going to be rest pop, pop up. Okay, everyone agree to release, right? Okay? Good. 150? Mm -hmm. Ready? Move it forward. Yeah. I think you can really see there, too, how, you know, with those markers Good. there, you okay. know exactly where you are. 120? Okay, now th this is what he was talking about, the nose cone. I have to be very, very careful. Take some time here. Uh, yeah. Yep, good. See, you have to make sure it's centered. And then you advance the wire now to make sure bring out a curve. And then now you can recapture. Yeah. Let's keep the very wire nice. to for hemodynamic, okay? okay? The reason why we do that, you have to push the wire in the outer curve, is that see the seat tap with the commissure alignment? You have to make sure it doesn't interact with that because now the commissure alignment, you now pretty much uh, often will uh, see that uh, in the inner curve of the ascending aorta. So we're going to go into the uh, coplanar view just to illustrate the point here. Okay, ready? Go, yeah. Excellent. Perfect. Yeah. You see, it's just on the cuts of you know, almost zero on the non, but this, remember, this is a coplanar view. It's not the cuts of a lab view. Grant is normal. Yes. Okay, let's do another view just to show the audience for this um, oral. So we made a really good point. And that okay, when you're in one, the LA view, time. you're not okay, paying attention to the depth on the yep. non. Mm. You can only Good. pay attention to Ready? depth on the non when you're in your ARIO or cusp overlap view. And that's one of those See? things that was hard. Look at that. Beautiful. Right, look at the depth here. I mean, this is kind of what, if you want to avoid a pacemaker, like a and also fine. this patient has a larger LVOT, so last thing you want is, you know, dive deep into the ventricle, then you have potential paravalic. So let's see what it looks like on echo. Okay, let's walk it. Hold on. Let's yeah, yeah. Walk the system out first, piece. and then leave the wire in the in okay, the ventricle. Come out, come out. Go ahead. One did second. Did, I, did, I second. Did, did, did Gilbert and the team did, did they switch over to the LAO at all, or did they? Yes, we did. We did. We did. We did. You were too, you were you were. Uh, we blinked the eye, and then that's yeah. it. We we deployed this valve very quickly. Sometimes yeah. we're faster <laughs> than the balloon expandable valve. So yeah. we basically have three key steps here, as you saw. Cuts overlap view, start to flower, two or three dots add up below the annulus. When you flower, if you if you have two or three dots above, then you're too high, you have to recapture. So we teach the fellows now, and Nega really brill, uh, elegantly show, show that uh, as we flower. Once you have 80% engaged, you you stop the pacing to a little more control pacing because so you avoid any risk of pop out, and you have to recapture, and you go to LAO view, and then you basically check the left cusp and also make sure your, your, your non-cusp is not too high. And if you're happy, as you saw here, then we proceed to release with uh, standard practice. You pull back the wire uh, to relieve the tension and then uh, operator one, uh, Nega here, uh, would apply a little bit for tension to uh, optimize the uh, final depth. You can see that here, it does not really pivot other than maybe in this case, uh, with the calcification, it went a little bit more aortic on the non, but actually ended up being perfect. How does it look, uh, um, Vivian and... Uh, yeah, echo here. 
So we still have a wire I mean, in mean, the yeah, prod. Just, uh, what you're seeing is probably a uh, wire, right? Yes. Yeah, because it starts from above yeah. the valve. That's the wire, the and through. there is um, mm. the valve there. Show us six. Watch the wire at the tab, okay? Oh. Oh, the wire. You oh, can see the leaflets. Careful. Fantastic. Very little. So error. one thing we have learned with transthoracic echo is that you have to really interrogate the valve to rule out PVL because a lot of times now with minimalist tab where people you know kind of take a quick look saying you know all good then they uh, you know basically uh, finish up the case Ready? but for us you know especially talking about lifetime management and optimizing the first implant we're really really aggressive about you know need for post dilatation minimizing PVL mm. uh, especially on low risk younger patients I think this is something to keep in mind and you really need to go to all the different views as we're doing it here now and you have to do Doppler flow studies to make sure mm -hmm. there's truly just no PVL rather than actually you miss a PVL I think this is so important, the time he's taking to make sure that this is as good as it's of an implant as you can get on this first go round. I think that, you know, there, we're, we're going minimalist and lean tabby, but these steps of really looking at the valve and, and, and looking at the hemodynamics, so important. I absolutely agree, because this is the time that you have to act to really Go to optimize this. If he was you asking about LAO. You know, so or at, least, at the very least to LAO, understand so what might be coming down the road for the patient. So taking that time. To get the right echo images, um, and if there's questions, you know, angiogram, hemodynamics, okay. things like that, okay, good. I, I think that's a okay, key good. point. It looks yeah. great. It so we're going to put, great, thank you, Vivian. So we're going to put you. a pigtail in down to do those hemodynamics, just hemodynamics. watch out for the wire. The Meanwhile, jet. when we are getting hemo, uh, we can show them the steps, oh of what you just mentioned. Okay? Yeah, Once we'll go for the steps again. I know with a live case, we went, we did the deployment relatively quickly. So uh, we'll go through that as a review while they set up the hemodynamics. Yeah. The so review. let me show that yeah. now. Uh, okay, so as you see here, this is our three-step approach. You can see it flowers. You can see that two of the three dots have to be at the annulus or just below, and you can see this parallax. So, uh, so that's for how you know that you're not too aortic, and that's important because if you want to recapture with the FX, it tends to be more aortic than actually more ventricular. Uh, that's what we learned. Now you can see this is the LAO view, right? Main, you see that LAO 23? Zero. So this is to pick the parallax out. You see that the left cuts is around, yeah, you know, yeah. two to three millimeters. The Very nine cuts is around three. And so we know that the valve is definitely, you know, below the annulus, not above. And that's when we decide to uh, release. And as Dr. Kinney did with the wire, wire management is very important. The nose cone to be centered. If it's biased in the outer curve, you have to really take the time to remove it to avoid the pop out. And then, of course, you can see the uh, final uh, impression here. This is uh, near the uh, free cusp view, and you can see the C tab <coughs> is the inner curve. So you know coming show alignment will be pretty good, and you can see this is the cusp of a lot view deployment uh, angiogram to show the true depth here. Okay, back to the panel. See the hemodynamics now? And the hemodynamics, let's show the hemodynamics show the now, please. And I think it's important to note that it's the hemodynamics really tell the story. And so I'm really glad you're doing this because somebody might say, well, gee, that looks a little constrained. We should just balloon it. And it may be absolutely perfect. And of course, it'll continue to expand over time. Um, but it's much more important that you have a great hemodynamic response and that you, you know, look for leak, things like that, than how it looks. And I think it's very important to resist the, um, urge to balloon things when they don't need to be ballooned. Very well said. And with this valve, because it is super annual, you can be out of round at the annulus, but where you are, where the leaflets are, you're perfectly round and it looks fine. So just chasing a picture, there's a, it's a really good point to try to avoid that tendency to want to make it look better. JY, JY, JY. I think this is particularly important. Every time you touch the valve, there's a slight risk of embolization and stroke. So I, I think it's a, it's a really important point. Minimalist also means the minimal uh, interaction between uh, your devices and the aortic annulus. Any other questions from the panel? We have to, we could discuss something about a small annulus and uh, maybe PPM in this uh, patients, especially women. We had started some discussion earlier about the smart trial. No, I think that that was a, an absolutely perfect demonstration of how this valve is supposed to be done. That was a, 
much faster deployment than what we do at our site, but you guys have it down as a team and those are your steps. We do those steps just a little bit slower. Um, but the, the result, um, Suzanne was just saying, like that's a perfect implant. Um, and so you're not aiming for zero. Um, our goal is three and you've clearly demonstrated exactly how to achieve that. Um, and then the, the commissure alignment um, as noted by the CTAB. So you can see that all of the features in this new delivery system in Valve will really help this case to be very straightforward. Um, more and more, this is my experience with these. How about the rest of the panel? Yeah, I agree. And I mean, I think that the efficiency of, you know, how you and your team have gone through this kind of shows just how far along we have come with both the devices as well as the, you know, the procedural steps as well. Um, and that is, that is in part due, you know, to the team, but also to the, to the advances we've made here. Yeah, you know, it, it's really been amazing uh, how uh, both uh, commercially available Valve platforms have evolved and the devices that we have are just so much more predictable. She size is smaller, but this FX is, I think, is a, a nice improvement over the previous iteration. Go and what's nice video. when it's combined with the cusp overlap technique, Animation. you know, you're going to have yeah. commercial alignment. And I think you're going to be able to quote pacemaker rates that are sort of five to seven percent, which is just really fantastic. With this deployment, I, I think this patient's likelihood with, a, with an arrow QRS is probably going to be less than five percent for permanent pacemaker. So that's that's terrific. Um, before we conclude, I think uh, there was some question about coronary reaccess, and I think uh, we have this beautiful video we, that we have made it uh, both on the app as well as the website, um, how to reaccess um, this particular valve. So if you see there, you have to make sure you're in the center and then try to get in through the diamond and leave the guide just at the ostium. Uh, free wire, you see there, and then once you free wire, you can just uh, go with the balloon and once you have the balloon, we always say have a guide extension, any one of the guide extension. So guide is uh, at the valve of the, uh, the diamond and then use a guide extension. And uh, once the guide extension is there, you'll be able to do the PCI. That was the initial balloon and now we are going to do the stent also. Once you have the guide extension, we are able, able to take care of uh, even calcific vessel doing a rotational atherectomy also. More important is how you come out. You see that? So you got to be very cautious that you will just take the guide extension out first and then slowly take out the wire and everything has to be done on the fluoro so you are not, uh, uh, you know, just removing the, uh, because there have been cases also of the dis uh, dislodgement of this valve. We uh, have the guide having caught in any one of the diamonds. So that review article as well as the app says about uh, various guide catheters that can be used uh, here, uh, which one is a better. So what happens normally when we are doing PCI in uh, non-tower valve cases, you have the IOTA, um, which is flexible. Once you have this uh, valve there, what have you usually need a smaller guide catheter. So if you normally use the FL, maybe you'll go with FL, FL4, then you go with FL3 uh, for the left system. Akari usually is the guide of choice. It goes even to the left side as well as to the right side. Any questions but for us Kini, are from you the routinely team? routinely looking at the coronaries before your cats or using CT, or does it depend on age? Depends on age and the history, uh, if possible. Now, because of uh, the pandemic situation and the patients did not want to come multiple times or every time they have to come, they have to get, uh, you know, uh, testing. Uh, at least 30% we are trying to do, you know, uh, of the travel time, elderly patients will try to do cath on the table, which is not ideal, but in the past we used to do it uh, beforehand. But uh, elderly patients, we are talking about 90, we will just go with the CTA findings. If there's no uh, significant proximal uh, vessel disease, we will just go ahead, plan the tower and just squirt some dye during the procedure. Well, that was a wonderful demonstration and thank you for sharing um, the, the app and the techniques with us here. Um, final comments um, from, the, from the panel? I, I, I think this is an excellent demonstration of contemporary implantation of a contemporary device, a self-expanding prosthesis, uh, excellent depth. Really, I want to commend the uh, Mount Sinai crew 
for just an outstanding procedure. It was done very quickly. I don't know if, we, if anyone noticed that, but I blinked and that valve was in it when it was at a depth of zero to one, zero to two. And this is what we really kind of should be able to offer our, pa our, our patients uh, in 2023. So uh, really just a perfect uh, procedure, uh, excellent results and uh, uh, accommodations to the crew there. Thank you, uh, Dr. Waxman and the entire CRT crew for uh, having Mount Sinai in this uh, special, uh, you know, women lunch on session. All right. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Thank you.